and fear. We bind all of that in the name of Jesus Christ and release your spirit of peace that transcends all understanding, spirit of love that endures forever and ever, spirit of joy that is so wonderful we don't even have words for it. And Lord, we ask that you would meet our needs according to your riches and glory, prepare our hearts. And Lord, as we worship you, let us not do it simply out of habit, but let us connect with you and deep within our spirit. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said together, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering, amen. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. Community is important. Christianity is not an individual sport. We need one another. We are the body. And uh, the scripture says that we are all parts of the body. So some of us here are the beautiful eyes, and some of us are not. Right? 
Hey, but we are all important. You're important. We're glad that you're here. We want to just uh, say hello to everybody. Uh, Rich gave me a, a good thing. So when you go around today saying hello, here's your question. How old were you, would you be if you didn't know when you were born? Okay, you got that? All right, y'all go say hello. Answer that question with each other. I always want to remind you, come on up here, Nate. I always want to remind you about your oikos. Remember oikos? Everybody say oikos. These are people that God is calling you to. If you're a believer, then God is calling you to minister to somebody, some bodies, and you want to have a, a culture of discipleship in your mind. There's somebody around you that you have been positioned providentially by God to minister to them. You may be the only believer in their life. And so we want you to be able to minister to them in any way you can. Amen? Amen. So I want to stop just a minute and let's pray for those in your oikos. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we, we ask you right now, Lord, just to be with these on our mind that you have called us to. Your people in our life, Lord, whose lives are broken, marriages are struggling, deep in depression. But Lord, you are the light of the world. And Lord, you are calling us to usher your light into the darkness. And so Lord, by your love and by your grace, give us the wisdom and the opportunity, Lord, to pray with people, to share our testimony, to invite them to church, to share a scripture, to just tell them that God loves them. And Lord, we know that you will use everything that we do, but help us to be available in every moment, every day. 
Lord, that we would serve you as you have called us to serve. We give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said together, amen and amen. the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and let your lips and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones, and not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked, foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned.
There's a time in the scripture when there's trouble in the church and uh, the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the church and he says, wait until you're all gathered together and in the power of Jesus Christ. And, and we learn from that that there, there is power when we gather together. Amen. And, uh, and I've been aware this morning that some are just in need of prayer. And... Um, speaking with June in the back, her sister Carol just got word that she's got about 30 days according to the doctors. We know that God is really in charge. Uh, I'm looking around and some are facing divorce. Others, your, your children are, are lost. I'm also reminded by Pastor Trevor preaching in his new place and um, 
and all that God is doing in, at our campus in Divine with Pastor Lance is in your valley today. Same about my, my brother, Pastor Robert here has gotten involved with, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but the, the Texas government's trying to put a chaplain in every school, and uh, he's been chosen to do all the hiring for that. And so, so God is, is, there's a lot moving. And so I just want to pause for a minute and, and uh, invite you to come to the altar if you want to pray. Whatever God is laying on your heart, whatever burden you have, if you need to sit down. But let's just pause and just pray for a minute. So let's, if you'd like to come to the altar, do so. pray, I just want to read Psalm 34 over us. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all of their trouble. The Lord is close to the broken heart. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the, the, the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Psalms 34.
Father, we come before you today humbling ourselves, recognizing that we need you in every way. Lord, I think of that old song, I need thee every hour. You know the burden and you know the pain, you know the needs that weigh upon us. But Lord, today as we come before you at the altar and we lay our prayers there and we leave our tears there, we cast all of our cares upon you. And Lord, we know that you are faithful and able to care for everything that we give you and more. And so, Lord, as we give you these cares, help us to leave them with you, Lord, and to follow you and to trust that you are God and you are working on our behalf. Your promises are true and you are working all things together for our good. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, for your grace, and Lord, at all of the needs. Lord, sometimes we don't even know how to pray. That's how I felt this morning. I didn't even know how to pray. But thank you for being my intercessor that my prayers go before you and you perfect them as you hand them to the fathers. Lord, I rest in my ignorance. I rest in my unknown. I, I, I feel no pressure to know everything, to do everything right. Lord, I give it to you. I live by your grace. And we just praise you this morning. You are the high king of heaven that has come low to be Emmanuel, God with us. And we thank you, Lord. And we thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you are not only God with us, but God in us. Your word is near us. It's in our heart, and it's in our mouth, Lord. And so we praise you this morning. It's in your mighty name we pray. And everyone said together, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Amen, amen.
the sun set free is free indeed. You can trust that God is who he says he is. He is sovereign. He reigns over all. And he is ours. Pray with me, church. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for all that you've provided for us, Father God. Let us not forget what you've done for us, Father. Let us always turn towards you in times of need, Father. And let us just begin to learn how to trust you when we begin to look inwardly, Father. I just ask that you cover this service today, Father God, and just open our eyes and our ears to your word, Father. We just ask that you bless us and hold us well, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Amen. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, God is good. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Praise the Lord. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. I want to continue this, this uh, series called The Humble Servant. And uh, I'm going to go in different, a few different places today. So a little Bible aerobics. Your fingers will get tired as you tap or swipe or whatever it is you do. Uh, but let's look in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 12. It says, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses. Everybody say Moses. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to present the, prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. I, w I want to stop right there. He's teaching us here that there should be a difference in how we approach God now compared to the Old Testament times because we have received the Holy Spirit. There is a difference. Sometimes we get stuck. And even though I know that I'm living in a New Testament time, and even though I know the Holy Spirit is in me, alive in me, and that I communicate with God differently than in the Old Testament, it's easy to get stuck doing the same thing, living a Christian life in an Old Testament way that keeps me from experiencing the highest form of life. Remember, God has called you to a life more abundantly than anything you could ask or imagine. Amen? And so let's keep reading this. He says, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. I like the King James that says from glory to glory. Amen. Which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. I, I want to continue this because we are living in a, in a day and time where Christianity is changing. And what it means to be a Christian is being watered down, diminished, and I want to remind you that God intends for every person, every believer to live an abundant life, to live a life that is beyond anything you could ever ask or imagine. Amen. I, I don't necessarily mean that you're all going to be rich. I don't necessarily mean the Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl every year. But what, what I do mean is that you have a joy that is unspeakable. A joy that is too good to explain. In the middle of the trial, I don't mean when everything is good. Anybody can be joyful then. I mean when your life is falling apart, you still have a joy within you. A peace that transcends understanding. A love that endures. Come hell or high water, you know that you know that God is still on the throne and you have him with you all the time. Amen? And, and he is calling you to live this life no matter what this world looks like. And the promises of God are not dependent upon any politician, any kind of politics, any election. God is God forever. Amen? And so we need to understand God is calling me to this. What's keeping me? What's keeping us from being there? And so I want to continue this. What we talked about last week and if you're following in your notes, if you want to follow the notes 
open your app or the little QR code in front of you and just click on notes there. But point number one here is the highest form of life. The highest form of life will manifest in those who choose to become humble servants of God. You got to choose it. Amen? If you think you're humble, you ain't humble. <laughs> Amen? If you go around, Brad, I'm so humble. <laughs> you have to choose to humble you. The Bible says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Amen? A lot of us have not been lifted up because we've forgotten how to humble ourselves. We forgot that it's a choice I got to make every. The sinful nature has made me prideful. Not that I go around and say, look how great I am, but that I put my own priority, my own agenda, my own desires ahead of what God wants easy. I do it without even thinking. And so we have to choose that. Amen? Now, here, here's, I want to read this to you out of Philippians 2. And we're kind of going back and forth here in these two passages. But in Philippians 2, verse 5, it says, In your relationships with one another, that's one another. I won't say nothing else. That means your husband, your wife, your kids, your neighbor, the neighbor with the dog that won't quit barking at 2 in the morning. All right? Y'all with me? Okay? This is everybody you come in contact with. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, he didn't walk around saying, y'all know I'm God, so you better be nice. He didn't walk around saying, you know I am the Messiah, so you better bow down. That's not how he did it. He humbled himself. It says, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, everybody say therefore. therefore. That is a powerful word. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Amen? Now, everybody say, therefore, therefore. the Father, and, and, and understand we're talking about the mystery of the Trinity and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but, but what it's teaching us here is that God, Christ, was exalted to the highest place, not because he was perfect. Not because he did everything right all the time. He did. The Bible says he was without sin, tempted in every way like us, but was without sin in, in 33 years, never sinned. But that's not why he was exalted. He wasn't exalted because he was a good teacher. He wasn't exalted because he was a good brother. He wasn't exalted because he was a good son. He was exalted because he humbled himself and became a servant. Amen? And, and so when, when you think about the highest form of life, God has called you to live life more abundantly, to live it to the full with vitality, with vigor, that you're enjoying life, living life, making meaning in life and fulfillment. How do you do that? You have to choose to be a humble servant, and then God will lift you up. Amen? Y'all with me? It is, it is. Now, the good news about that is it means that you don't have to do everything perfect. In, in, in Christianity today, especially in America, we, we have uh, twisted Christianity to some degree so we see everything through the prism of performance. And we think of Christianity, well, I got to do everything right. I got to do this and I can't do this and I have to say this and, and, and all that. And, and what this is saying is you don't have to be perfect to live the highest life. You don't have to do everything right. You don't have to be the best husband. You don't have to be. All you got to do is humble yourself and seek the Lord. If you seek first his kingdom, he will add all. If you will humble yourself, you will find yourself being a better dad, being a better husband, being a better woman, being a better man. You will find it happening whether you're trying or not. Because when you get out of the way and let God do what he wants to do in you, then you will be who he's called you to be. Amen? The issue is, we don't do that. We don't do it. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to do it all right. Now look at the Philippians right there. He says, in your relationships with the one another, have the same mindset. Everybody say mindset. mindset. I, I want to propose to you today that being a humble servant is more about your mind 
than your behavior. If you're following in your notes, servanthood is not a behavior as much as a mindset. Look at what he's saying. When Moses is read, everybody say Moses. Now, now, when it talks about reading Moses, it's talking about the law. The law was about what you can do and what you cannot do, what you're supposed to do and, and what you need to ask for forgiveness for. And so when they were living under the law, it was constantly being reminded to them, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, don't do that, don't do that. And if you do this, then you need to bring a lamb that would be slaughtered for forgiveness. And, and they got stuck in this, how am I doing? But it says that when we receive the Holy Spirit, there is freedom. Amen? Freedom from the law. Now, don't misunderstand. We don't take God's grace for granted. This isn't a license to go and sin and do whatever you want to do. It is a freedom from the mindset of always worrying, am I doing it right? Am I being perfect? Am I doing the right thing at the right time, the right way? Is my prayer perfect? Is my, is my dream? All of that kind of stuff. And, and what it's saying is now you don't have to live trying to figure out if you're doing it right all the time. Live humbly according to your purpose, and God takes care of the rest. Amen? It, it is so difficult when you're always thinking about, did I do it right? That is pressure. And even as Christians, we put so much pressure, and there are so many preachers and so many churches that, that will almost make you feel like you're going to hell if you mess up. You live under grace. Amen? That's not a license to sin. It, it means that God has saved you and forgiven you despite your sin. Therefore, go and live a holy life to say thank you to a God who loved you when you weren't lovable. Amen? And so when we begin to understand this, we want to serve him. But now it's not about, am I doing it right? And so I don't wake every morning. I got to do this, this, this. It's what is God calling me to? What is my purpose? What is my higher calling? What am I here for? What is my life intended to be? in the kingdom. Amen? It's a mindset. The enemy wants to keep you veiled. Remember the glory of God. The, the word glory is, is related to anointing, and the word anoint means to smear, right? Turn to somebody to smear you. Don't, don't do that, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but why, why do we anoint with oil? Because we, we, it is a way of smearing the oil upon your skin. It represents the Holy Spirit, and it's God saying, I'm going to smear myself into you because it gets into the pores, gets embedded in who you are in your physical body. And he's saying, I want to glorify you. I want to smear my goodness all over you, to slather you all up in my goodness so that when you say it's because of me and people see your life and my goodness in your life when you glorify me because I've glorified you then they will turn to me it is God's plan of salvation to save the world because his people are living in the goodness of God amen and so we should never get trapped into this well my life shouldn't be that great no God is calling you to live a great life he wants to make your name great he wants you to have an abundant life he wants to smear his goodness all over you amen and the devil wants you to get stuck so that you don't live your purpose. You're just trying to stay out of trouble. This is the Old Testament. The Old Testament is just stay out of trouble. The New Testament is live your destiny. The Old, the Old Testament is if you don't do it right, then you don't have grace. The New Testament is I already know you're not going to do it right, but I've given you grace and power anyway. Amen? Amen? And, and so it's very easy for us, even though we're in a New Testament time, to get stuck in an Old Testament mindset. If you want to be a humble servant of God, you have to change the way you see yourself. you got to change the way you see your destiny and your life and what it's supposed to be. Amen? And so let me give you your, your next note there. We have been fooled into equating servanthood with religious activity. And so we think, well, I, I'm serving God. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm here every Sunday. I, I, I go and I work at the soup kitchen. I give to the poor. I'm serving the Lord. And that's what we think. And we compartmentalize. Well, I'm going to go and serve the Lord. I'm going to be on the, the greeting team today. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to be on the praise team today. I'm going to serve the Lord. They never asked me to be on the praise team. I don't know why. But I think to really understand what it means to be a humble servant in the mindset, 
we need to understand the mindset of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Notice he's talking about two different things, not just sin, but anything that hinders. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorned his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the mindset of Christ. I want to take you back to the Garden of Gethsemane. Christ knows what's about to happen. He goes into the garden, and he begins to pray, and he says, Lord, if there's any other way, if there's any other way to take this cup from me, if, if we can still accomplish your will without me going to, if there's any other way, yet he comes to that place, he surrenders, not my will, but thine be done. Amen? But, but here he is, and, and it's not what he wants to do, and yet we learn from the Apostle Paul, he's filled with joy. Joy doing what I don't want to do because I know what the effect will be. Amen? You see, in order to be a humble servant, you got to do stuff you don't like to do. Amen? Amen? If you're going to be a servant to your husband, sometimes you got to clip his toenails. Can I get a praise the Lord? <laughs> I mean, sometimes you got to do. I, I, was, I was driving in, in traffic the other day, and everybody was so friendly to me, waving in ways I've never seen. God wants you to be a servant, but to be a servant to people that aren't nice, to be a servant and do things that aren't pleasant, to be a servant, you have to reframe your mind or all you can think about is, what am I doing here? And it says, for the joy set before him. When he went to the cross, he looked beyond the pain, beyond the misery, and he saw the potential of you and I coming to salvation receiving his blood, washing away our sins, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and living a life of abundance. Amen? And, and so there, there has to be, I, I have to get up in the morning instead of thinking, I really don't want to do this. I really don't. I don't like that person. They're not very nice to me. How can I serve them and find joy knowing that when I am living the way God wants me to live, it is going to release power into their life, and I can have joy knowing that I, I may not be able to see it today or tomorrow or the next day. It, it may be a, a cross, and, and I'm in the tomb for three days, but at some point I'm going to see that God has used me to do a miracle, to save a marriage, to bring prodigals home, to change the world, to do so. I can know that I know that God's going to use me, and then I can come to the end of my life and say, my life mattered. And that's the highest form of life. Amen? And we, we, we get all mixed up with, with, with religious activity. Well, I, I do all this for the church. What do you want me to do, preacher? Anybody get up this morning and on this beautiful Sunday morning, the day of the Lord, the day the Lord has made that we shall do what? Rejoice and be glad. Did anybody wake up in a bad mood? Let me ask it different. Did anybody wake up with somebody in a bad No, I'm just... <clears throat> religious, if religious activity equated with the highest form of life then everybody who's doing religious activity would be full of peace and joy and understanding. But instead, you got church splits. You got Christian couples divorcing. You got husbands who should be committed to the Lord and their wife, and they're committed to their work and somebody else. And, and, and so religious activity is not necessarily mean that you're being a humble servant because you got the wrong mindset. You can come into church in a bad mood. Amen? I see it. I look at your face from up here. I can tell who's in a good mood. Who's in a, I can tell what marriage. I said, Lord, help that marriage. I can already see it. I, I mean, I can see everything in your face. Just because you come here, just because you sing on stage, just because you greet or whatever you do, just because you go and help the home, none of that matters if you're not connecting people with God. And you can do all of that without the Holy Spirit. You can do it all without the joy of the Lord, all without the peace of God. And you can do it. You can be a good moral person, a good ethical person, and never live the life 
that God has called you to live. Amen? Next thing you notes here, the mindset of a servant is to live in such a way that others are filled with abundant life. Amen? You, you can go and help somebody move. Anyone ever ask you to move? I remember my wife said, I want a pickup truck. I said, no, everybody's going to ask us to help them move. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And you can be there all day long. But if you're in a bad mood, you're not connecting anybody to the Spirit. Oh, you may be serving the Lord in, in, in one way or mind, in, in your own mind, but in reality, you're not being a servant because you're not connecting them with the joy of the Lord, the peace of God, the love of God, the Holy Spirit. That tra- You're not connecting them to any of that. You're just making them feel guilty because they ask you. They're thinking, how much pizza I got to buy to make them happy? Right? Let me read this to you in John chapter 17. So we're talking about what, what does it mean to be a humble servant? How do I choose that? In, in John 17, it says, After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they know you. Now, we think of eternal life as heaven, and certainly eternal life is in heaven, but eternal life is now. Eternal life is, is, is heaven, the joy of the Lord. Whatever it's going to be like in heaven, thy kingdom come on, on earth. Is, is, y'all know what I'm saying. And, and so it, it is living in the presence of God right now as if you were in heaven, heaven, the joy of heaven, the peace of heaven, the love of heaven. No matter what this world has, you do not belong to this world. Amen? And, and so we're living like, and so eternal life is me knowing him. Not knowing about him, but knowing him. Amen? Now there are people in your life that you know them so well, that you know how they're going to act, you know how they're going to react, you know what they're going to say, you know how they're going to feel, you know everything about them before it even happens because you know them intimately. See, eternal life means I am helping somebody get so near to God that they know him. We, we have intellectualized Christianity so much, we talk a lot about intellectual concepts and who he is, but ultimately it is by the Spirit that we know God. And we have to have the Spirit and we have to connect with the Spirit. As deep cries out to deep, the deepest part of my spirit where God is, I need to connect with other people on that level or I'm not being a humble servant. Amen? You can come to church all day long. You can build the whole church. You can do all kind of, you can watch the preacher's car, which I'm fine with that if you want to. It's fine. (laughs) But if you're not connecting people to the Spirit, it's not being a humble servant. Are you with me? Why are we not living the highest form of life? Because we have changed what it means to be a humble servant. I just got to show up. No. It's not what you do. It's how you do it. In your notes there, the mindset of a servant is to live a life that familiarizes others with the character, love, and goodness of God. Amen? John chapter 7, Jesus said this. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Amen? Amen? This is eternal life. Remember, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. When the Holy Spirit is in you, then you know God, and you commune with him through the Spirit. Amen? So by this, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him would later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. This is a switch. When I receive the Holy Spirit and live by the Holy Spirit, I'm living into my purpose. I'm living into my mission. I'm living the abundant life. And what does that look like? I humble myself as a servant and live with the attitude of Jesus Christ so that whatever I'm doing, I'm connecting people with the Spirit. Amen? In your notes there, the mindset of a servant moves us to live with the spirituality of Christ. Amen? You should not be afraid to pray wherever you're at. 
You come across somebody who's having a hard time, doesn't matter if you're at H-E-B, your mother-in-law's house, it doesn't matter what's going on, the best thing you can do is pray for somebody. To remind them that there is a God who knows them by name. A God who cares about what they're going through. And, and it's so easy to say, well, I'm going to go and volunteer. Right? And right now in, in the corporate world, everybody's got to have so many volunteer hours. Volunteering is great. And, and the church runs on volunteers. But ultimately, if you're not connecting people with the Spirit, then it's just a social club. And so uh, uh, of everything we do, go and help somebody move. But, but after you help them move, sit down there and bless their home. Pray for them. Right? Pray protection over them. Pray for their family. When, when you were going through some, uh, one, a man in my, my Oikos, he, he's, I'm not going to say who he is, but uh, he, he, recently his father died. It's not somebody that we're really friends with. I'm just trying to build a relationship. His, his father died, and, uh, and, and he told me, and so I've been trying to connect with him. The other day I saw him on the street, and I was so late. Man, I, I was late. I know that shocks y'all, especially those who know me, <laughs> but I was very late, and I came across him, and I was about to get in the car, and the Spirit said, no, 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 this moment's about him, and so I went over, and I said, how you doing? He just broke down, big, giant, burly, ex-Marine he said, I, I don't know how to deal with it, with how everything happened with my dad dying. And we prayed right there in the front yard. Now, whatever it is that I should have been at didn't mean a thing compared to that. Amen? You see, I, I, I want us to begin to understand that Activity is good. Religious activity is good. It's the vehicle that helps us get to God, but it's not God itself. Church is good, but just sitting in here is not going to connect you with the Holy Spirit. We have to have the spirituality of Christ and dig deep and connect people to a higher God. Amen? And when we do that over and over and over again, we begin to be exalted by God. He glorifies us. He smears his goodness on us. He smears his joy and his peace. I want to be all smeared up. Amen. Don't you? Amen. Let me share this with you and I'll be done. John chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus is speaking to the woman at, at the well, the Samaritan woman. Keep in mind, culture said that he shouldn't have been speaking to a woman at all. And culture said he shouldn't have been speaking to a Samaritan because of the racism of the day. But if you go back and read chapter, the very beginning of the chapter, it said, now Jesus had to go to Samaria. All right? Now you know the culture. They didn't go through Samaria. They went around Samaria. So he didn't have to go through it, except he had a divine appointment with this woman. And she becomes the evangelist. She becomes the unlikely evan a woman who has been divorced, living with a man, not married, going to get water in the middle of the day because everybody else doesn't like her. They look down on her. They gossip about her. And this is a woman full of all kinds of sin. God said, that's the one who will spread the gospel in Samaria. The unlikely. You don't have to be perfect. You just got to humble yourself before God and serve him. Amen? But here's what he said in verse 13. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Amen? Any, anyone ever, ever see the, the old show, uh, The Beverly Hillbillies? And all the old people said, amen. Right? And, and so, you know, Jed, was that his name? Jed? Jeb, without, you know, trying to shoot some uh, squirrel or something, I don't know, and, and, and a bullet hits the ground, and here comes oil everywhere. And the next thing you know, oh, Jeb, no, I'm just kidding. And, and so he, 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 he <laughs> I'm shocked y'all can even tell what I was saying. And so, <clears throat> but it just exploded. This word welling up right here means gushing without effort. 
He says, when, when you connect somebody with the living water, the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, it springs up in them. It just bubbles up from the inside. And so it changes. They move from somebody trying to resist temptation, doing everything right, somebody moving from the Old Testament mentality where the glory of God is veiled into somebody that just naturally being transformed by the Holy Spirit begins to have the goodness of God bubble up in them until it wells up, gushes out like a huge geyser, just getting everybody wet, everybody soaked, and everybody's getting smeared by the goodness of God because you brought the river of life to them. Amen? What could be better than that? Solomon tried it all. He made a lot of money. He ran after women, pleasure, all the vices that we can think of now. He did it all. And at the end, what did he say? That is all meaningless. But living for the Lord, being a humble servant, connecting people with him, that's what makes life mean something. Amen? So you are a servant. And when you're a servant, now you can have the joy that Christ had. For the joy set before him. He knew before he went to the cross, God was going to work. If you take the mindset of a servant, you can know when you get up in the morning, God's going to do miracles through you today. You can just know it. You don't wonder, will God do it? You just wonder when God's going to do it. You don't wonder, can God use me? You just know he will use you. You don't wonder, am I good enough for God to use me? You know that you're not good enough, and that helps him use you. Amen? And, and it changes everything. And that's the highest form of life. That's what makes life matter. Amen? Amen, let me pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, you have called us to be your humble servants. And Lord, right now we just want to get into the nitty gritty of life. And, and many times while we're trying to serve the Lord, we lose the fruit of the Spirit. We get moody. We get irritable. Even as we're doing the things you call us to do, stoked in religious activity, but having an irritable spirit. And so, Lord, we pray that you would pour yourself into us, empty yourself into us by your Holy Spirit, that we would be transformed. So that irritableness will go away. The fear will go away. The insecurity will go away. The pain will be healed. So that in all things, at every moment, we are in step with your spirit. where the fruit of the Spirit abounds in us. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are in us. And so, Lord, I pray for any today that struggle with, with having the mindset would give us an assurance that even if we don't get done what we think we need to do today, that you will do even greater things. Even if we can't check off what's next on our to-do list. That you will use us to do something greater than what we can imagine. And not only that, Lord, but you will take care of the time. You will ensure that what needs to be done gets done. Let us trust in you. And help us every morning to come before you. And humble ourselves, reminding ourselves that you are God and we are your humble servants. Help us to live that. And Lord, we thank you in advance for what you will do and how you will smear us with all of your goodness. And we will give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a praise offering this morning? Amen. Amen.
class, um, those that are receiving their certificate, y'all come on down. Wherever you are, <laughs> coming out of the crevices. Come all the way up on the stage just the way you like it, so we can all stare at you. <laughs> y'all give them a round of applause as they come on. We appreciate them. It's good. All right. Well, so we have a growth track here at Crossroads. Um, the design of that growth track is that you start with your very first time here to ending it being a disciple maker. We want to go one step further. We don't want to just create disciples, but we want to create disciple makers that are going to bring other people along. What is a disciple maker? That's somebody that's saying, hey, I'm following Jesus. I ain't perfect. I don't know everything that I'm doing, but I want you to come along with me. Right? And that's a disciple maker. We, we see the, the example of Jesus. He had a plethora of religious elite that he could have grabbed. He didn't. He went and he grabbed a bunch of fishermen. And he says, well, I'll teach you along the way. Right? And so we want to become disciple makers. Um, these guys listened to me talk for eight weeks straight, so we figured they deserved something. Uh, but... <laughs> Felt like that was a, like a bad comedian with a pity clap at the end, but I'll take it. Um, Just trying we, to be a humble servant. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> we go through a lot of thoughts. We have a lot of deep conversations. There's a lot of vulnerability that happens in these classes. We want to encourage all of you to take it, right? Um, this is at the very, let me explain the growth track. The first one is the New Beginnings class. We're going through the, the basics of what it is to be a Christian and how Crossroads plays a part in that. Then we step into the transformation class where we're saying, Jesus wants to take you out of the way you live today and live in the blessings of God today, right? We're not waiting for the day we die. We're, wait we're living in the promises of God today, right? And then we, we say the third step is joining a small group, and the fourth is going through this lay ministry class where we walk through and we say, how has God equipped you for ministry? So they are all got special days that they're going to preach here in the next eight weeks. So right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> this just says that they completed the lay ministry class. We, we've had a lot of talks. We've had individual meetings. And what I'd like to do now uh, is these are the people that are going to change the culture from the inside out. Amen. Right? And that's what we believe that the graduates of the lay mission class are going to be doing is they're going to be sitting in these pews taking a whole different approach to the way that they're using their life. Um, our first goal in this class is spiritual growth. No one can make you grow, but the church can provide as many opportunities as possible. The second is a change perspective. That change perspective is that I'm a crier, and I don't know why I'm crying. Um, that our life is not our own. We are made by God and for God, and he wants to use us. Amen. Our third goal in the class is community, and our fourth is to develop your own thought. Get into the scripture and start tearing it apart for yourself. Don't just trust a bald-headed guy on Sunday morning. Amen. Right? Amen. <laughs> so we have talks. There's a lot of plans of what could come out of this group, and so what I want to do um, before we move on to membership is I would like to pray over these guys. So if y'all could stretch your hands this way as we pray over uh, what God's going to use them for. God, I am thankful for these individuals coming from all sorts of walks of life, different stages of life. We see an example just on the stage that your spirit is never done working, never done guiding. And you've laid visions and, and desires in the hearts of these people that align with your vision. And we just pray that you would give them the strength and the courage to boldly pursue those things. that your Holy Spirit would just overflow out of them, that it would just be a natural byproduct that when people are by them, they would experience your love. We thank you for individuals that are taking the time and sacrificing just a lot to go through to better this place, to be able to serve everybody else in this place better. 
We thank you for who you are and the strength that you've given all of us in this room just to reach to today. And we give you all the honor and the glory for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Y'all give them a round of applause. Are you talking to me? Yeah, if, especially if they're joining. So, We got a lot going on this morning. So now we're going to do some membership. Some of you are part of that. I know Gigi's part of that. If you're a part of the membership, y'all stay up here. Everyone else that is doing the membership today, y'all come on up from the crevices. Okay, Gigi, you're the only one that is here today that is joining. Joshua, Joshua's already a member, and now you're, you're joining. And so this is uh, Gigi, Geraldine, we call her Gigi, and uh, Joshua, and they are awesome people, have a great family, and uh, they're going to be received into membership today. I want to remind you that there's no special coupon. This doesn't mean you get a discount into heaven, anything like that. What, it, what this means when you join a church is you have already committed your life to the Lord. You're already living in, in His grace. But this is you realizing that God is calling you to live out your ministry here at Crossroads, whether that ministry is in the the organization of the church or whether this is where you're fed and you have your ministry as well. Uh, We want you to live in that ministry. But you understand that today that this is you saying God has called me here to live out my ministry. Amen. And, and everybody here, if we, we vote, right, the way we vote, if you're an official member, if you've been up here and done this before, if you'd like to receive Gigi, who's a great person, I vouch for her. How about you, Josh? You vouch for her? Okay, good. All right, that's two. Uh, she is awesome. Just, just say amen. 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 Y'all give her a round of applause, all right? Amen. Appreciate you, man. Well, we're glad that you came today, and isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. I want to remind you about a few things. So Saturday is our Fall Fest, okay? And so if you haven't registered yet, then you need to register. You can do that on the app. That way we know that you're coming. Uh, We also still need some volunteers, especially men. They can help with parking. Out in the foyer, Miss Sarah's out there at a table. You can go to her and, and tell her whatever you would like to do and see how she needs some help. Also, the shirts are here uh, for sale, so especially if you're a volunteer and we want to make sure you get a shirt, there's one right there. And uh, <clears throat> that's very, thank you, Vanna. That's good. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so make sure you go out there and do that. Also, November 12th, everybody say November 12th. <laughs> November 12th, we, we are starting Angel Tree, all right? Carolyn, wave your hand. So Carolyn's in charge of our Angel Tree. If you don't know what this is, It's a ministry where we buy Christmas gifts for children whose parents are in prison or in jail and they can't do it on their own. And uh, so we do it on their behalf. And uh, and so Carolyn has a great vision of how to to go a little bit further and be year-round. But November 12th, if you want to be part of that, and the reason I'm telling you now is because a lot of people were disappointed last year because you you didn't get involved. And so we have 205 children that we want to get gifts for. And so on November 12th, she'll have a meeting, and she, you'll be able to, to adopt the kids and get the gifts that you need. And then also, we want to take them home-baked cookies. And so if you can bake cookies, then we would like for you to do that. You can get with uh, Carolyn. Or to, no, let's go with home-baked, because I'll, 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 you know, if you, if, you don't, if you don't know if you're a good cook, bring them to me. I'll test them. <laughs> I'll, I'll see how they work. No, how, however you can help, but get with Carolyn. If you have questions today, I'm sure she wouldn't mind sharing it with you, but make sure that's a very important thing for children who already feel lost. They already feel lost, and we need to do what we can. These are children in our neighborhood, in our neighborhood, okay? It's very important for you to know, all right? And uh, if it is your first time here today, we're glad that you're here. We want to invite you back to the back. We have Don back there and Pastor Vanessa we want you to connect with them. We have a gift for you. Uh, in the bag, one of the gifts is a book I wrote on how to respond to negative responses in order for God to do greater things in your life. So if you're having a hard time, that's a great book for you. Uh, and finally, since Sarah's not here, let's say it together. Our mission statement is to love people into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ.